Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for taking the time and the effort to have made it here this morning. This talk is about Prabodha Das Gupta, a photographer who broke the barriers of commercial photography in India all throughout the span of his long career. Prabodha, whose photographs dwell in the collective imagination of both the advertising and the f uh, artistic fraternity, was an artist, and his self-commissioned projects like Women, Ladakh, and The Edge of Faith reflect the imagination of a man who could take anything in his hands and make it come alive. His work and his words conquered many hearts throughout his life, as they did at the first edition of the Delhi Photo Festival in 2011, where he displayed a working draft of his last photo series called The Longing, a work in progress that he seemed to have finished not long before his demise in 2012, and a glimpse of which we were able to see last night at the inauguration of this edition of the Delhi Photo Festival. The festival this year pays a tribute to this unrelentingly shy and charismatic artist. Now, one thing that was sure to quite about anyone who would come in touch with Prabuddho or his work was his grace. He seemed to be a certain embodiment of this word, and it seems obvious even when one looks at you know the video of his talk, which was done in this very room in 2011, which is again uh, anchored by Mahesh. Um, you can see that video on YouTube and you see that quality, you know, uh, irradiating from him. And throughout his career, he was, you know, something like a rock star. You know, you, you can imagine someone, you know, like a guy with a guitar on stage, you know, women falling at his feet and giving high fives to people in the public. Prabhupada was like that, but with photography. And I think that, you know, that rebellious spirit, that charisma, that fascination of the people with his work, was something that um, really, really marked him out. Um, and it started maybe somewhere when his first photo book, Women, came out in the 1990s. But grace is seldom a word that is, you know, attributed to photography. You can talk about a graceful dancer, a graceful gesture, maybe a graceful piece of music. But what does it mean to talk about a graceful photograph? His last work, The Longing, through its sheer ineffability, unanimously evokes this notion. I finally decided to pick up a dictionary and, you know, ask myself, what does grace actually mean? And I saw that grace is linked with gesture and with action, with the simple elegance and refinement of movement. Prabhudho was someone who was forever in motion, from point A to point B, oscillating between the opposing poles of his life continuously, between Goa and Delhi, between advertising and personal work, between reality and dreams. This talk is about how his photography dances between his circumstances and his aspirations, or to put it more clearly in the context of study of art, between sculpture and music. The objective of this lecture is to re-familiarize the public with this popular and unseen work and to underline some of his primary influences. This talk is going to be an hour long, so I'm going to give you a short trailer. The first hour, I mean, okay, it is actually one hour. The first part is going to deal with the role of sculpture in his work. The second part is going to um, enumerate some of the key aspects of his work, which we are going to discuss together by looking at one of his um, uh, pieces of commercial work, which a lot of you might have not seen. And the third part is going to talk about his relationship with music through a synthesis of all the notions we discuss in the last work, The Longing. Now in 2011, Prabhupada repeatedly stressed upon his relationship with music and we will try to discover a bit more of this relationship that he had between the stillness of sculpture and the motion of music. We will try thus to see a little better the inherent grace of his photographs. Prabhudha Das Gupta was born on the 21st of September 1956 to Pradosh and Kamla Das Gupta. The younger brother of Pradeep Das Gupta, Prabhudho studied history and started his career as a copywriter. The fascination with the cameras and the dark room that belonged to his elder brother gave the young Prabhudho an avenue into the world of photography through an early age. Pradosh and Kamla Das Gupta were sculptors who began their career long before India gained its independence. 
His father Pradosh was considered as one of the founding fathers of modern Indian sculpture, who continued producing some of its most emblematic works right until his demise in the 1990s. He was also a master to some of India's finest modern sculptors such as Sarbari Roy Chaudhary, who himself passed away in 2012. Kamala was a great sculptor in her own right, but she renounced her career to uphold her duties as a housewife and mother, all the same being an integral part of the work of Pradosh. Now, Pradeep and Prabodhu spent a lot of time at the National Gallery of Modern Art, which was directed by his father Pradosh from 1956 to 1970. Prabodhu lived with his family at the NGMA all throughout his childhood, and his parents' studio and the NGMA galleries allowed him and his brother to soak Indian art through their pores. However, it seems that neither of the children were ever encouraged to handle clay by their parents. And their father would tell them quite regularly, whatever you do, don't become an artist. The daily struggle of being an artist is thus much harder to communicate than the accolades that it may bring. And Prabhuda left for his MA in history in the eight, late 1960s. After dabbling with his first copywriting assignments, he dedicated himself to his passion for photography before his career took off in the early 1990s. His career started with his many advertising assignments, which ran parallel to his personal photographs, many of which were female nudes. The very first photograph that he sold as a work of art was bought by his longtime friend, the sculptor K. S. Radhakrishnan. As the sculptor recounts in an article, in 1984, I remember when he showed me a few early prints from his experiments with photography for some feedback. This was one photograph of a female torso lying horizontally, and the lighting was such that it reminded me of one of Henry Moore's reclining sculptures. The nudity of the figure was not important, but you can see the extreme sensuality. Radha, or K.S. Radhakrishnan, bought the photograph from Prabhudho for 500 rupees, and Prabhudho spent more than half the money in framing it. But now I don't know if, I guess Radha is probably not here, but I guess, you know, we would all have liked to see that photograph, which was, you know, Prabodho's very first work of art. But um, it's with the launch of this photo book, Women, in 1995, that we were able to see this part of his work, and a much larger audience got to appreciate this extreme sensuality that Radha talked about. Now the female body, is a theme that was a favorite of both Moore and Pradosh, pra Prabhudo's father. And the two sculptors shared many stylistic attributes in their individual approaches, including the reclining nude as a privileged study of form. These sculptures demonstrate the reduction of form to the simplest masses that may evoke the realm of the emotive, which Pradosh seemed to deem as the purpose of all modern sculpture. This sculpture, for instance, which we see here, called Volume in Three Masses, effectively demonstrates this approach towards composition. Sculpture is a longer process of translation from thought to material than drawing, and the process of creation is not detached from the material in Podosha's work. So this drawing still gives us an idea of what um, this aesthetic of form and simplicity consisted of. Those of you with a very attentive eye may have already noticed the similarities between this sculpture and this photograph that we just saw. Now, in the same vein, there is this photograph taken from women where we see a very apt demonstration of the very same idea in Prabhudho's own work. So you see, for instance, how the hip, the breast and the arm come together as three masses to create a same seamless form which was typical of the sculptural work of his father. The comparison between Prabhudho's photographs and his father's sculptures was never extensively explored in public, since Prabhudho's work flourished with the idea of looking ahead rather than looking back. So instead of being labelled as a demonstration of his father's sculptures, his photographs were heralded as, you know, um, the very first book of Indian photographic nudes, and uh, th which brought Prabhudho both critical acclaim and controversy during that time. The irrefutable beauty of his female nudes and his success 
in being able to represent it, seem to have evoked a very strong emotion in the public in the 90s, and it marked the first grand moment in his career. These images suggest an interplay with light and surroundings, with the interior and the exterior, and we will now progressively start touching on these aspects of composition in both Prodosha's and Prabhuda's work. So now form, as you can see, you know, in these um, photographs and these sculptures through our um, first remark was something that was a privileged notion in Prabhudo's and his father's work. Now, which was something which was related directly also to another notion, which is that of color. So as we know, a lot of Prabhudo's work, you know, until his demise, at least his personal work, was in black and white. And the absence of color seems to be inherent in both his and his father's work. It seems to privilege a demonstration of form and its interactions with light and shadow. Now, light and shadow are essential elements of photography as well, you know, something which gives it a common ground with sculpture. But what did his father think about that? Because as, like I told you, you know, Pradosh used to say, one, you know, children don't ever become an artist and two you know what was his perspective on photography what was his you know um, idea about taking up photography as an art so there's this little snippet from the 1955 catalog called my sculpture which came out in his father's name where Pradosh explains the following colored photography shook the very basis of art and painting both in the fields of landscape and portraiture Photographers, by some clever processes, began to get the effects of etching in their photography. Beautiful sculptural forms started coming out of the machines in hundreds every day, threatening the very existence of sculptors. Pradush thus describes modern sculpture as a protest against the excessive realism of photography. As for Prabhudho, his photographs seem to privilege form through this very absence of color in his images. However, both in Prabhudho's and Pradosh's work, it seems that form is not singularly linked with just the units of the human body. The hips, for instance, are at the same time an essentially essential part of the study of the human body and at the same time a form unto itself, which may be suggested by other means. So, for instance, we see in this first sculpture called Lovers by Pradosh Dasgupta, the form of uh, the two individual units, two individual lovers who are united, which together seem to create the same seamless form as the hips. The knee was again one of the body forms that was an essential part of Pradosh's sculptural vocabulary. So for instance, you can see here in one of his very well-known sculptures, um, one knee of each subject in the sculpture helps to create kind of base for the composition and in this photograph for instance you see the very same idea has been taken one knee of each subject coming together with that of the other to create a base of the image so we see the exactly the same approach in both these works it is then also the theme of this you know couple that is repeated in a lot of Prabhudha's work first within women itself as we see in um, these two photographs from the book and then subsequently, in his later works such as Ladakh in 2000, where he seems to have discovered his father's sculpture in nature. So we see in the bottom left uh, a rock relief in Ladakh, which Prabhudho took as a photograph. And then in the edge of faith, where a bit like the female nude, these uniform couples become themes unto themselves. But the privilege of form is not the only thing that's common between sculpture and photography. Of course, sculpture is capable of realism that is similar to photography, like we can see in these images. But for Pradosh, photography was essentially a recording medium. And we do not understand that we are looking at photographs of these sculptures, and rather, you know, we're looking at projected images of these photographs. But both Pradosh and Kamla actually used photography as a support for their busts. So this is the scenario. If the subject was not alive as a model, he would sculpt it live. And then when the sitter would go away, he would use the photograph of the model to sculpt the rest. So photography worked as a kind of trace of the existence of somebody to model the rest of the study. 
it was an approach that both the father and the mother shared so basically kamla had sculpted both her sons in the same way where she would tell her sons to sit down and then she would start sculpting them they would run away and uh, then she would continue working on them so obviously you know to get a kid to sit still as it is is quite tough so um, photography in those means was something that was quite handy we'll come back to something more emotive about this relationship between the artist and the subject in prodoshes and prabodo's work but another thing that is technically common to both sculpture and photography is the technique of reproduction through casts so for example for bronze sculptures like the bronze sculptures we saw in prodoshes work um these sculptures follow always the same process first they start with clay then they for this first mold they would cast it in plaster and then finally from this cast it would be cast in bronze in that sense the method of production of their sculptures were not far from that of photographic prints from negatives so something that started with the first object that is a kind of um, that's incapable of being exhibited but which is a blueprint so negatives for photo and molds for sculpture and which is then used as a basis of reproducing more durable forms like bronze for sculpture and paper prints for photography so we have now seen some similarities between photography and sculpture in the realm of art and the coherence of the vision of prabodo and pradosh as artists but then again pradosh did not consider photography as an art and did not advise his children to become artists which basically leaves photography as a commercial venture and which is how pradosh the father of prabodo saw it but although prabodo wholeheartedly embraced the commercial aspect of photography he had slightly different plans now we have already discussed a few attributes of prabodo's photographs so just to remind you we discussed form we discussed color and we discussed themes like the twins but now it is time for us to see what his commercial photography brings forth i would like to now play a little extract of prabodo's talk here in 2011 where he dwells a little bit more on this relationship to come back again to that word commercial um uh, yeah actually you know because i do i i i occupy actually a very unique position because of that um the so called serious art world kind of sometimes looks down at nose and say oh but he's a fashion photographer he he does commercial work and when i work in the commercial arena because of the personal work i do they say oh he's too artsy farsi you know he won't be able to really grab the commercial parameters and do justice to whatever we have in mind so it's kind of in between i'm perched on a kind of still in between and i think it's um, i love that because on the one hand the commercial work really gives me a sense of discipline a sense of the craft a sense of uh, and of course it allows me it gives me the the uh, luxury to be able to pursue subjects of my choosing so one really you know feeds the other okay so a lot of prabodo's commercial work started to flourish from the 1990s and it was not just commercial work it was you know the time that he and his chief collaborator tanya were living in these were all you know um works of the print age this was when you know brilliant advertising was there all over the country in india the kind that today a decade later you know with the Uh, with this uh, diminishing of the print and the emergence of cell phone cameras and digital images we've become incapable of recreating and that that is some a bit of a strange paradox but how did prabodo's personal work take birth from his commercial work he recounts this in his interview with navin kishore in a small anecdote from the times when he had shifted to goa and i cite i got an assignment from delhi who from a client who exports and wanted to do a catalog So for the want of any better ideas and I knew I was going to Goa for the week after I said why don't I go to Goa and you send me a bunch of clothes I'll shoot this whole thing on local people in Goa I thought he'd turn around and say oh god no I want some glamorous girls doing the things on the beach and all that but he took to it and he said fantastic then he sent me the clothes and I started looking at places and people asking around trying to find the right mix that's how I started meeting people in the community entering their spaces and things like that now what 
does his commercial work have to teach us further about his personal and artistic work? For this, I would like to suggest a bit of an exercise. I now propose that we look at one of these commercial catalogues done by Prabuddha for an export house called Creative Impex. So this is going to be um, a small series of images that we are going to look at. And after that, we'll try and see what this reminds us of his personal work. So, um, we just had a look at one of Prabhudo's more commercial uh, works and for those of you who are already familiar with some of his personal work and who were present here for what we just saw, are there any comparisons that you can make between what we saw before and what we just saw? Anything, anyone in the audience who could tell me some differences, tell some similarities? So we first saw, just to remind you, we saw uh, a few images from his first photo book, Women, and we saw um, some images of his father's sculptures. Any similarities that you can think of? Anything? So one thing, for instance, you might have seen a recurring theme that was in his work, which is twins. So that's one thing. We saw, for instance, uh, this image of this theme that was that seems to be quite fond of Prabhudo. What else? So one thing, I guess, which is very clear is that uh, the first thing, of course, is color. So for Prabhudo, you know, who seems to have seen everything in black and white, you know, this gratuity of color in color photography was something that was perfectly adapted to his commercial work. And a lot of his commercial work, of course, was thus in color. Now, we remember what his father, Pradosh, had to say about color in sculpture. And it reminds us of, you know, this relationship and difference between commercial and personal work. But now, he's also done a lot of commercial work in black and white. So, you know, it's not necessarily something that essentially demarcates his personal and personal work. So what else? Is there anything else that you can think of? Okay, I'm going to make this easier for you. Now, the one thing that you might see is a bit different in his work in women and in this work is the concept of place, of uh, the situation. So most of his portraits in women and, for instance, the sculptures that we see of Pradosh, which we just saw, they do not evoke a sense of time and place. They seem to rather want to decontextualize themselves. They seem to be floating freely in time and space without attaching themselves to a place or situation. And they exist autonomously. Whereas in these series, the sense of place, the sense of situation is very much there. And so the photographer gives an ample amount of detail to props 
an object and the emphasis on clothes which of course here is the commercial ex assignment is you know undoubtedly present now it was in the edge of faith which uh, is the second uh, personal work that prabodho did that he continued to explore this aspect so for instance like i s like you know prabodho said in to navin kishore it was his assignment in goa with um, this particular export house that allowed him to go into interacting with the locals and you know go into their lifestyle and explore these settings these places and it is something then he just wholeheartedly explored in his relationship between uh, the subject and the place so the person who is in this place and the things that surround him and this was the project you know that um, became his second body of personal work and you can see that between this and this you know you can already see certain similarities of approach towards the subject and towards the surroundings now one image actually does that in women and which we see right here and we can say that you know this picture it's in black and white it's very similar to the commercial work which you just saw and uh it's it has that you know um thing of situation it has that study of the female body so what is it here what is that one thing missing in this photograph that we haven't talked about we have the study of a female body we have the study of the situation but there's something else and let's listen to what prabodho had to say in this regard all the the women who had uh agreed to do these nudes you know it was one thing to do a nude picture for somebody you know maybe a friend or maybe an acquaintance somebody that you could trust and you could actually you know um, you could you could arrive at that place of vulnerability where you could take your clothes off and say okay you know and of course there's a degree of narcissism in all of us and you know sometimes it's flattering that you know you're asked to do a nude so i i got lucky that way and i had a lot of people who agreed to do this for me but when it came to publishing the book i never thought of this i was so naive i thought you know they've done these pictures and these pictures are now you know ready for any kind of uh, exhibition or book or anything like that but i also knew that i had to get the permission to do it and it was a as expected now in retrospect when i think about it it was a blanket no i mean it was how am i going to allow you to put a picture of me in a book that is going to be available at body sons in khan market maybe on the shop window and my you know the, the postman is going to pass by my toby might see it my my grand uncle my aunt my nephew my dog you know I, it's, it's just completely out of the question <laughs> so uh and that's when it struck me oh it's not that easy so anyway so the process of the editing of this book had to be left to the subjects of the book i had no say in it because i couldn't i couldn't you know i couldn't pull out a picture and i i did i went to each one of them with three or four options of course i had the picture that i wanted to be in the book right up front and uh, and as like i said it was mostly it was no you can't do that or or it was like you can't put my body and my face in the same picture you can put it on the next picture you can have a portrait of me on one page and you can have my naked body on the other <laughs> which which uh, is finally what the book turned out to be not out of choice but because that was the only that was the that was part of the dynamic of the making of that book so what we understand from that anecdote was that um the study of the human body and the identity of the subject were detached and presented separately in the same body of work so this was the technique uh in the editing technique or you know the con technique of context that prabodho used and we can see that actually it's exactly the same technique that he uses for his models in his commercial work so you see for instance you know the portrait of the subject and then the representation of the clothing so very simply you know this um suppression of the identity of the subject allows to um objectify it and to use it either as a mold for um a study of the human body or as uh something to display a product 
Now there's something, there's something that it tells us, that uh, something, some important thing that it tells us about Prabodhu's approach to the female nude. You know, one, he follows a rather classical approach of privileging the form of this subject over her identity. And two, he does not ignore the identity of this subject and tries to give it another image to express itself. This allows his work to objectify and to subjectify the female body at the same time. These images are, as um, uh, Radha said, they're extremely sensual, but they aren't necessarily erotic just because they're nudes. But certain photographs of clothed models might actually be more sensual than these um, female nudes. So for instance, in this photograph, you know, if you can see it, I don't know if you guys can see it clearly, it's um, a really um, perfect Lolita-like study of the young woman. You can see, for instance, her heel on top of her foot, the hands closed in front of her body, the, the, the look of you know, her face that's looking down at the same time with shyness and up at the same time to acknowledge the camera. So we see this um, very sensual study that is in his commercial work. And there is this missing attribute that makes it that sensual, and which is the one that we already discussed, which is place. It's what gives the subject uh, a sensual charge by situating it in a context in time and space. That's what creates you know, this moment of sensuality that can then mix with the memory and imagination of each spectator. So this same study of the female body, when detached from the concept of place in itself, stays an academic study. And once it does attach itself to a context like this, it starts to give a more central aspect. So we will come back to this aspect of memory and imagination. And for that, we will go to the final leg of this presentation. Now, like everyone else, Prabodho imagined and enjoyed music. Regardless of his profession and activities, everybody enjoys music and everybody listens to music. But this relationship with music was much deeper than that for Prabodho. And we caught some glimpses of the same in his presentation at the 2011 edition of the Delhi Photo Festival. Now, it's time to discuss this relationship that the photographer had with music and what we can see and hear of it in his last work, The Longing. So one of the few things that we do not know about Prabodho's relationship with music is his fondness for the guitar. One thing we do know is his very famous fondness for Leonard Cohen. Cohen was for Prabodho his true master, a man whose music, poetry and life seem to have left a profound impact on the photographer. Now, one thing that we probably don't know, that the title of his last series, The Longing, seems to be very close to that of Cohen's last published body of poetry, which is called The Book of Longing, and which Prabhudo seems to have been familiar with. Another thing we probably don't know is that Prabhudo was actually an accomplished musician. He took formal lessons in classical guitar at the Delhi School of Music and for a period in his lifetime actually practiced every day. Prabhudo was very fond of the classical guitar and he could play Cohen's Chelsea Hotel, but it seems that playing the guitar was maybe not just a hobby, but something that was actually in his blood. And we'll see how. Pradosh Dasgupta had an extreme fondness for Indian classical music, which he transmitted to his disciple, Sarbari Roy Chaudhary, the famous Indian modern sculptor. The exhibition catalogue, Music and Sculpture, talks about how Chaudhary spent a large part of his career in the company of musicians, and often chose them as the subjects of his sculptures. But the first musician that influenced Chaudhary was Pradosh himself, the father of Prabodho. Pradosh was an All India Radio artist at one point of time and was prolific in singing Hindustani classical compositions, as well as compositions by Nazrul Islam and Robin Roshangit. There was something else that Prabodho had to say about music in 2011, which now brings us finally to the longing. Prabodho said that the longing was an improvisation over the sequence of some of his personal images. And a member of the audience asked him, where will this sequence end? And this is 
what he had to reply in this question. But I think somewhere there is a, you know, when you're doing anything and you're doing it with that kind of ferocity and you're devoting so much time, energy, your whole sort of uh, everything into it, um, I think, that it, I mean, it's like creating a piece of music. Again, I keep bringing the analogy back. I mean, you could, you could keep fussing around with the notes. No, I don't like that second verse. Maybe I can stretch this a little more and see if I can bring it back again to the same note. I mean, like that's what happens in jazz. You know, it's, it's all based on improvisation. So every time you play the same piece, you're actually stretching it a little further. Except that here in photography, once the project is complete and you're done, that's it. You're left with your, uh, you know, whatever you've done in that particular period of time. So basically here Prabhudo tries to tell us about um, how his relationship to music translates in his work into sequence of images. So in this sequence, for instance, the longing, there was an act of improvisation on his side on this sequence of images on how he brought forward certain motives, certain images, and how he repeated certain themes. And this thing tells us, you know, something about um, the longing as being a musical act for him. It echoes the response he gave, you know, when an audience member asked him why he chose his series to be accompanied by music, to which, you know, his answer was, why not? He said that it was his prerogative as an artist, and it seems that despite his admiration for Leonard Cohen, he did not want to choose a song with lyrics to accompany the slideshow, because he thought that it would create a connection that would be too literal and it would not allow enough scope for the imagination of the spectator. He wanted people to hear their own stories in their minds when they looked at his photographs. As an artist, he wanted to evoke an emotion without anything being said, and which is probably the reason why he wished his slideshow to be accompanied by music for classical guitar. Now, indeed, one feels a very strong surge of emotions when one sees the slideshow, but none of his subjects really seem to be expressing any strong emotion. So it's not a work of catharsis, I to say. So one asks oneself, how is it that you're touched by a series of images of people who seem to be so devoid of emotion? Music moves us because of the directness of its relationship to the pleasure of sensation without having to pass through visual representation. You can close your eyes and you can enjoy a raga or a sonata without having to imagine the violin or you know what the face of the singer looks like. In short, music is purely abstract in its relationship to visuality. This observation was a driving force behind some of the earliest forms of abstract art in the beginning of the 20th century. And it is also something that Sarbari Roy Chaudhary elucidated in his approach to sculpture. Music's relationship with the subconscious is also one of memory. Its pleasure allows us to feel the same pleasure that is associated with nostalgia. Now, however, contrary to what Chaudhary says, Prabhudho is able to attain the same effect of abstraction through his photographs in The Longing. Now, abstraction is not as much of form but rather of the identity of the subject. What I mean to say is that we saw, for instance, in the um, photo series Women, how Prabhudo would, for the same subject, use the portrait where you can see the identity of the person and at the same time use the body of the person as a study of the human form. So what he does is that he abstracts the identity of the subject. So in that way, even in the portraits shown in his, w his series Women, you cannot identify uh, who that person is. Now, in these photographs, you can seem to, the, the, there is, um, how do you say, a sort, sort of mix between these two aspects. That is, to represent the identity and at the same time to abstract it. So what the result of that is, that even in the portraits that you see in these series, you can dwell into nostalgia without being attached to the image of the subject. So you can see an image of a person which without necessarily saying, oh, it's that person, oh, it's that person. But we'll hear a bit of an example of, you know, this situation. Geoff Dyer, a writer with whom Prabhudha was closely associated, 
used one of the images of the longing as a cover of one of his novels. And he recounts a very interesting anecdote about his cover and a reaction that one of his friends had to it. And I cite, Shortly after the US paperback was published, I received an email from my friend, the photographer Adam Bartos, who admired the image on the cover. He wrote to me and said, When I first saw it, it took me a few moments to realize that the beautiful face submerged on the cover belongs to my friend, the actress Sarita Chaudhary, whom I met when Neera Naya was making Mississippi Masala. We went out together for a time. The photography was probably taken, I believe, in Khajurao on the set of the Kama Sutra. Now, obviously, this was not true. So, as Daya later says, the lesson to be drawn from this story is that Prabhudo's pictures disorient the person looking at them. They attach themselves deeply to the spectator while simultaneously floating free of the conscious life and memories, refusing to become a part of the documentary or circumstantial record. Something like music, how when you for instance hear a piece of music, you associate to your own personal memory rather than just to the memory that is being represented through certain lyrics. And as evidence, whenever these images or these musics are presented to you, they are not records of someone else's life, but records of your own life. We are in the realm of dreams and memories. Exactly whose is never clear. Now another thing that we can say about this relationship between music and photography is the immediacy of its effect. You can, for instance, think of every time you hear a piece of music and it instantly um, attaches itself to your memory. You listen to a melody and you can repeat it you know, for days afterwards. It's and all of us have songs running in our heads, you know, at unexpected times in the day. And I feel that, you know, some of Prabhupada's photographs had that same uh, way of sticking to the eye, you know, the way melodies stick to the ear. Because they're still, but at the same time, there's something abstract about them. And the use of a point-and-shoot camera, for instance, a lot of photos of his series, The Longing, are used um, with a more basic technique rather than the usual SLRs that he implies, sh that shows you know, this very intuitive approach that he had towards photography, which he fully explo exploited in his series The Longing, and which is something like you know, the approach that we personally have towards music. Like, for instance, when we hum a melody or you know, when we, um, we apply ourselves to music intuitively. Now, Prabhudu seems to have had a relationship with music that was perhaps just as intimate as with his subject in The Longing. The Longing is a personal diary that belongs to each one in his or her own special way. The combination of the intimacy of personal eroticism with the objectivity of a documentary approach, wherein the subject's identity and his body are no longer separated but shown as the person with whom the artist shares a relationship, is something that we see most notably in the photographic sequences of Nan Golden. So the Ballad of Sexual Dependency was one of the most emblematic photo series that shared that very special relationship with the subject. And just by chance, it was one of those series in which Nan Golden used a lot of music and had a very active relationship with the music used with the series. Now we see a very similar approach except uh, in Nan Golden's subject uh, her subject is her boyfriend Brian from the same time. Now this quote that you see on the bottom is one of the handwritten quotes uh, written by Prabhudho, which he seems to have copied on a piece of paper and which explains his relationship to the subject. It says, the notion that there is nothing new to photograph is an absurd one as it preludes the integrity of a personal vision and the subjective nature of all reality. This tells us how Prabhudho had a relationship with his subject, which was not one of just studying it as a form, but as an individual, and as a piece of his own personal history. We know now very little about Prabhudho's relationship with music and how it was fed into his work. But with the photo series, The Longing, it becomes much more clear to us when we consider this aspect of music what Prabhudho's relationship was with his own subjects. And 
like I said, um, Prabhu Do was someone who was very deeply inspired by Leonard Cohen, he, by his songs, by his poetry. And this phrase, for instance, you know, this little piece by Leonard Cohen seems to show that same very intimate and at the same time very documentary approach towards the subject. Something that we see both in the work of Nan Golden and in the work of Prabhudo and which seems to have been shared by this musician. So to um, pay um, my respect to um, this uh, photographer and to this musician, I would like to read a small extract from um, Cohen's last piece of prose called The Book of Longing, the one that we talked about. Now, I don't know if we can see it clearly, but uh, okay, let me just try and make this a little bit more readable. Mm. No, I don't think that's happening. I'm just going to, um, if you just give me a second, try and make it maybe a more readable for the public. Okay, so I'll tell you what. Um, I'm sorry you can't read this piece of text, but I'll try and read it from what I can see from here. Okay, just give me a second. <laughs> I'm having a bit of a technical glitch. So no problem, we'll just manage. We have a couple of minutes. I would really like us to be able to see this piece of text, this piece of text by Leonard Cohen, which is called The Black Photograph and which I think would be uh, an apt illustration of the relationship between photography, music, and um, memory. Okay, so I think this is more readable, right? So let's just now have a read of this work by Leonard Cohen called The Black Photograph. By and all, or by and large, as you say, the reading public's disinterest in the novel of sensibility behooves itself very well. Or, to put it differently, I am very different from most of you. And the older I get, the gladder. I should have come from a different country to entertain you with the horrors of my native land, but I didn't. I came from your very midst, or so you could say, your very mist. I am your very mist. But don't be alarmed. You are not in the presence of a verbal fidget. If I strain too easily to push a pun into profundity, it's only because I am at the end of my tether. I've taken too much acid, or I've been too lonely, or I've been educated beyond my intelligence, or however you might call to explain me. It is a pity if someone has to console himself for the wreck of his days with the notion that somehow his voice his work embodies the deepest, most obscure, freshest, rawest oyster of reality in the unfathomable refrigerator of the heart's ocean. But I am such a one, and there you have it. It is really amazing how famous I am to those few who truly comprehend what I am about. I am the voice of suffering, and I cannot be comforted. Many have tried, but apparently and mercifully, I am immune to their shabby consolations. I will capture your tear without hardly trying in the vast net of my idle prattle. I am going to tell you such a love story that will make you happy because you are not me. But who knows? You may be sobbing behind your ecstasy as I've hinted or even promised. I think it's a good story. I think it's tough. I think it's got fiber. I've told it to a lot of people and they all liked it. I'm going to tell it to you. Among my credentials, I am the creator of the black photograph. Ask some informed commuter on the subway, I mean, might growl scornfully. Oh yeah, he's the guy who takes a lot of trouble setting up a picture and then holds his hand over the lens when he snaps it. I'm truly amused by this fictitious traveler's conversation and I will let his description stand for the process of my art. My art, my eternity. I will be the delight of future eyes when this grotesque parody of humanity has evolved into something no doubt worse. These future monsters of the unborn seed will pass many excellent vacations of intensity immersed in the emanations of my colorless rectangles. 
A few years back, a clever New York art dealer attempted to capitalize on the most obvious aspects of my eternity. And for a few months, I was a figure on 10th Street and the darling of a small clique of curiously small and thin people who were devoted to promoting a new form of human expression called art science. Some of these fanatics tried to convince me that they understood what I was doing. Needless to say, they were barking, as was Adam of the fable, up the wrong tree. Nothing anyone has ever said about the black photograph has ever meant a fig to me, except, of course, for Nico. She could read them. She knew what I was doing. She knew who I was. And I long for her still. I will pick my way back through the boredom and the irrelevance of the last decades and tell you of a time when I was truly alive, in the human sense, of course. In the other sense, in the realm of Gretchen Urn, in the annals of crystal and imperishable diamond, I have remained the absolute creator, life itself, to whatever I touched, as immediate, as irresistible, as wild and undeniable as a woman's hand on the adolescent groin. I have been I am, and I will be the of matter and the redeemer of the inert. Now you may have an inkling of the spirit in which I conceived for myself the challenge of the black photograph. Nico perceived me immediately through all my pathetic bullshit, as some would and should call it. My work, among other things, is a monument to Nico's eyes. That there was such a pair in my own time and that I met them forehead to forehead, but the black photograph sang to other irises, and yes, corneas, retinas, and optic nerves, all the way down to the foul leather bag of Nico's restless heart, another human heart, that this actually happened, constitutes the sole assault on my loneliness that the Eternal has ever made, and it was her. Therefore, I was in New York, at a certain time, in a certain place. Actually, it was a Chelsea hotel. This clever art dealer, Colin Ahab, possessed the sad misimpression that I would enjoy coming in and going out through a grimy lobby, heaped and hung with the fashionable excrement of the ambitious hustlers in the studios above. Enormous reproductions of cigar boxes, pillow-like canvases billowing over the innocent frames like so many beer bellies, infantile electromagnetic devices to advertise the artist's acquaintance with technology, mobiles so badly constructed that they compounded their capacity for psychic offense with a physical hazard, cognac snifters of various size, painted red and enclosed in a glass cabinet, all in the name of some dreary change of perspective, as if that's what humanity needs. And all these needs trick, all these ugly motives, all this poisonous medicine, chest of Gotham cunning, promoting itself as the urgent specific to a dying culture. All this profanity made by flesh, quickly accumulating layer after layer of vicious grit generated on 23rd Street and in the low havens of the neighborhood a presage of the dirty treasures soon to be unnoticed, burial under the sands of time. That's the hotel he put me in. He thought I was one of them. Also Dylan Thomas sailed out from that lobby to pierce his eye on a rose thorn and hence or thence to assume his rightful overstuffed easy chair in the crowded pantheon of flabby heroism. It can be quickly divined, I am no friend of the age. So this little um, piece of prose is something that illustrates you know, this relationship that Leonard Cohen had with photography. And he also talks about how um, his eyes would sing the images. And it's something that you know, brings us to a kind of conclusion about the relationship between music and photography, which is that Music and photography obviously are ontologically separated arts. I'm waiting for the slide to load, but um, once it does, it's only a schema diagram to show you that on the basis of temporality, now music is something that is in time. It's a sensation that we 
that corresponds to the flow of time. Whereas photography is something that is just one moment, so to say. And on the other hand, music um, doesn't represent anything. It does not seek to represent anything. It, you cannot, how do you say, um, paint the face of a woman with musical notes because the instrument of music is not created for that purpose. But photography, by the nature of it, its instrument, is representative. This opposition between music and photography was, you know, this, this, this schema in which the work of Prabhudo seems to have dwelt in because at the same time he was someone who came from uh, the background of sculpture and at the same time he was someone who had the aspirations of moving towards music. So I, I guess my, um, my PowerPoint has decided to um, to shut itself for now, but but I guess this is um, where I wanted to bring my conclusion to, which was that Prabodho's work is a perfect example of how two different media, which are very separated, sculpture and music, can participate in his creative process as a photographer. It gives us, for instance, this relationship that we have with the subject, one which is either representative or one which is poetic. It helps us define the coordinates in which Prabhudo's work seems to have moved during his lifetime. And I hope that through this lecture, we've been able to identify some of these um, key aspects of his work and of his relationship with the subjects that might help to look at his photography in a fresh perspective and to be able to give our own approach towards photography as photographers more matter to deal with. Thank you very much. I uh, first of all, thank you, Piyush, for this very insightful uh, lecture. Um, I wanted just to ask you a question regarding the last point you made, the comparison between photography and music and the ontological opposition. And um, I was wondering what it meant for you to um, consider photography not only um, in terms of single images, but as a sequence and to put it uh, in a musical context. Um, thank you very much for that question. Uh, I think I might have actually uh, skipped on that point and it was something that I wanted to um, illustrate as well. Now, you remember when we saw this uh, photo series of creative impacts, um, I can't show it to you right now because um, things are different in my computer for now, but in this photo series you see a very cinematic aspect, you know, almost a kind of uh, fictional narrative conjuring itself up. and. It was this specific act aspect, the sequence, that was one of Prabhudo's um, main um, points of reflection in The Longing. So for instance, in the photo series The Longing, there is no specific sequence. The images don't have to follow a narrative according to which they have to follow point A, B, C, D. All of these images seem to somehow um, be like you know a stack of cards that's the metaphor that uh, Prabhudo used uh, like a stack of cards you know uh, scattered on a on a table and you pick one after the other this um, work on sequence like you said is something that undoubtedly is something um, that brings music and photography together because the same thing exists in music the sequence of notes the sequence of phrases is something that is not necessarily um, you know, configured to suggest a narrative. It's something that you can play with. And I think a lot of exhibitions um, at, a lot of the digital exhibitions at the uh, festival this year are going to be sequences, of course, and I think a lot of them are going to be accompanied by music. So when you see these digital exhibitions, I'm sure a lot of them would have been set to music by the um, the photographers who, who exposed them. So sequence undoubtedly is something that you know with his work, the longing, and even in his photographic work, in his photo books, 
was something that does bring uh, music and photography together in their experience of time. So that, yeah, that's a very good observation. Thank you very much because uh, uh, otherwise, yeah, I would have just told you, yeah, music A, photography B, uh, you know, two inch and level meet. But yeah, that, that is true. That is one of the ways of bringing them together. Uh, this is just an observation uh, where you say it's again about the same thing, music and uh, photography. Mm -hmm. uh, you say music doesn't represent anything, whereas photography. Well, I beg to differ with you because uh, music definitely represents a lot. And especially in the case of Indian classical music, mm -hmm. where each and every, not only the time, where the seasons have been represented by music. So it's just an observation where you say, uh, music is not representing anything. Thank you very much for that comment. Um, no, it's, when I said that music doesn't represent anything, it's um, not uh, an aesthetic or a poetic judgment. So it's a purely uh, material judgment. So what I'm trying to say is that, of course, now for instance, you know, even, um, you know, music obviously does represent you know, through its context, through, for instance, you know, songs in churches or, you know, choral songs or religious music, they represent certain um, pieces of, um, you know, mythologies, for instance, right? Ragas, for instance, are set to certain seasons and, you know, to certain moods that they seek to res represent as well. What I was trying to say is that um, music, you know, through its instrument is not something that represents visually. So to say, it's something that represents visually in your imagination, yes, but it is not the um, nature of the musical instrument. So, for instance, photography is, you know, a medium which is representative by default, right? In the sense of the technique, just the ontology. The relationship that music has to representation is something that's purely poetic. It's something that passes through your imagination. It, the image, thus, is something that is created in your mind, right? So this, you know, um, transition from something that is abstract to something that is representative happens in the mind. And music seeks to represent that through um, its aesthetic. But what it represents, and this is where I come back to Prabodo's work, is in your own memory, right? Or in what you have already seen and which is stored in your mind. So that is also the point that I tried to touch on with um, Prabhudu's relationship to music and his work in The Longing, which is like, just like in music, the images that you see are more the images in your mind than they are images on the outside. So I hope that you know, this brings these points a bit uh, more clearer. Uh, I think we have time for just one more question. So not mine is not a question it's just an observation there was a professor called Ramachandran who was no, who was nominated for the Nobel Prize in neurosurgery and he has made a, he's written a book called the left brain right brain where he says you don't hear sound you see sound so the connection between an image and a, a sound is actually on the same wavelength so there are connections that probably are much more than that. Hmm. Thank you very much for that comment. And I think um, this neuroscience undoubtedly is bringing, um, you know, this aspect of the singular connection between images and sound back to the human sensation in the brain. It's something that has a word in art, and it's what we call synesthesia. So a lot of abstract art um, from the beginning of the 20th century was inspired by experiences of painters like Paul Klee who claim to have exactly the same experience. Now this neuroscientist explain is the nature of human brain of the perception of sound and some artists would actually feel um, music that way. They would actually be able to hear images or they would actually be able to see sounds. So undoubtedly those are relationships that do exist and which are being proven by science and which have also been explored in art in the beginning of the 20th century. But what's, again, uh, very interesting to note here is that these pieces of art are mostly works of abstract art. 
So this, you know, to represent this relationship to music. So for instance, let's say that um, I do understand that I am able to um, I'm able to see the sounds that I'm hearing. How do I represent that the sounds that I see? Will I represent the images that they evoke in my mind? Or will I try to represent that really basic sensation of the conversion of the sound into an image in my mind? So that is where the artist has to make that choice, that movement between abstraction and representation, and which is what um, we are trying to study in this relationship between music and photography. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm Swapan. Uh, just a continuation to the, uh, of that conversation about the differences between uh, photography and sound. Or uh, I think it just troubles me when that comment comes, because I don't think uh, we should look at comparing the two mediums, just like this, this beaten to death comparison between painting and photography. I think that also is quite a redundant comparison. There are two different mediums which have different sensibilities and the differences you talk about are intrinsic to the medium. Mm -hmm. Photography is a visual medium, sound is, is using another sense. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, what may be more relevant is uh, the symbiosis of the two, mm -hmm. where you're using sound in your narrative, uh, rather than you know uh, dissecting as to whether the image comes before, the sound comes before. I think it. It's more about uh, using the two to dwell on each other yeah. than are we listening to music, are we, listening, are we seeing pictures. Mm -hmm. And I think intrinsically since they are different mediums and they involve different senses, I think this is one way to find a symbiosis between these two very beautiful mediums rather than make structured observations about them because then I think for, uh, any medium becomes very literal. Mm -hmm. And I think the best things like, in, I think the best Pictures make you, if you're seeing a landscape, you're probably hearing the sounds. And same when you're listening to Four Seasons of Vivaldi, you're actually feeling that, that kind of, uh, you know, uh, ruling on your senses. So I think it's it, rather than getting into the literal differences, I think it's always nicer when, you know, I think the symbiosis of the two works together. And, and I think that's, that's what one really should dwell on rather than you know the differences because then it kind of gets into a very literal space yeah yeah thank you very much for that swapan i i think you know what swapan said uh, right now is very much in the spirit of uh, what prabodo's approach was to these things you know and um, i remember uh, the conversation that you guys had uh, in the 2011 edition of the delhi photo festival as well and you know i'm when I brought this slide up to talk about these ontological differences and everything, I'm, I, I'm sorry to have forgotten, I, I, I excuse myself, to have forgotten you know, the whole purpose of this exercise, which is to talk about Prabodo's relationship with music. You know, we are not here to um, debate about you know, the similarities and differences between music and photography. We are here to see how Prabodho, as an artist, related to these media. And he had that kind of approach to music, really. You know, that's why when he said, that, you know, when someone asked him, you know, why music? He said, why not? You know, I'm an, it's my prerogative. And I guess you know, my purpose was to see how poetically and how emotionally an artist relates to these different media. So thanks for <laughs> bringing me back on track. I think, I think um, it was probably this last slide you know, from my PowerPoint presentation <laughs> that had shut down that, um, that didn't allow me to come back there. But thank you, Swapan, for that concluding remark. And um, I thank you all for your attention. And um, I hope that you'll have a great evening, a great day, and you'll enjoy the F Delhi Photography Festival for the days to come. Thank you. Kamla Das Gupta were sculptors who began their career long before India gained its independence. His father Pradosh was considered as one of the founding fathers of modern Indian sculpture, who continued producing some of its most emblematic works right until his demise in the 1990s. He was also a master to some of India's finest modern sculptors such as Sarbari Roy Chaudhary, who himself passed away in 2012. Kamla was a great sculptor in her own right but she renounced her career to uphold her duties as a housewife and mother, all the same being an integral part of the work of Pradosh. Now, Pradeep and Prabodho spent a lot of time at the National Gallery of Modern Art, which was directed by his father Pradosh from 1956 to 1970. 
Prabhudu lived with his family at the NGMA all throughout his childhood and his parents studio and the NGMA galleries allowed him and his brother to soak Indian art through their pores. However, it seems that neither of the children were ever encouraged to handle clay by their parents. And their father would tell them quite regularly, whatever you do, don't become an artist. The daily struggle of being an artist is thus much harder to communicate than the accolades that it may bring. And Prabhuda left for his MA in history in the eight, late 1960s. After dabbling with his first copywriting assignments, he dedicated himself to his passion for photography before his career took off in the early 1990s. His career started with his many advertising assignments, which ran parallel circumstances and his aspirations, or to put it more clearly in the context of study of art between sculpture and music. The objective of this lecture is to re-familiarize the public with this popular and unseen work and to underline some of his primary influences. This talk is going to be an hour long, so I'm going to give you a short trailer. The first hour, I mean, okay, it is actually one hour. The first part is going to deal with the role of sculpture in his work. The second part is going to um, enumerate some of the key aspects of his work, which we are going to discuss together by looking at one of his um, uh, pieces of commercial work, which a lot of you might have not seen. And the third part is going to talk about his relationship with music through a synthesis of all the notions we discuss in the last work, The Longing. Now in 2011, Prabhupada repeatedly stressed upon his relationship with music and we will try to discover a bit more of this relationship that he had between the stillness of sculpture and the motion of music. We will try thus to see a little better the inherent grace of his photographs. Prabhudha Das Gupta was born on the 21st of September 1956 to Pradosh and Kamla Das Gupta. The younger brother of Pradeep Das Gupta, Prabhudha studied history and started his career as a copywriter. The fascination with the cameras and the dark room that belonged to his elder brother gave the young Prabhudha an avenue into the world of photography through an early age. Pradosh and um, you can see that video on YouTube and you see that quality, you know, uh, irradiating from him. And throughout his career, he was, you know, something like a rock star. You know, you, you can imagine someone, you know, like a guy with a guitar on stage, you know, women falling at his feet and giving high fives to people in the public. Prabhudo was like that, but with photography. And I think that, you know, that rebellious spirit, that charisma, that fascination of the people with his work, was something that um, really, really marked him out. Um, and it started maybe somewhere when his first photo book, Women, came out in the 1990s. But grace is seldom a word that is, you know, attributed to photography. You can talk about a graceful dancer, a graceful gesture, maybe a graceful piece of music. But what does it mean to talk about a graceful photograph? His last work, The Longing, through its sheer ineffability, unanimously evokes this notion. I finally decided to pick up a dictionary and, you know, ask myself, what does grace actually mean? And I saw that grace is linked with gesture and with action, with the simple elegance and refinement of movement. Prabhudho was someone who was forever in motion, from point A to point B, oscillating between the opposing poles of his life continuously, between Goa and Delhi, between advertising and personal work, between reality and dreams. This talk is about how his photography dances between his Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for taking the time and the effort to have made it here this morning. This talk is about Prabhudha Das Gupta, a photographer who broke the barriers of commercial photography in India all throughout the span of his long career. Prabhudha, whose photographs dwell in the collective imagination of both the advertising and the f uh, artistic fraternity, was an artist, and his self-commissioned projects like Women, Ladakh, and The Edge of Faith reflect the imagination of a man who could take anything in his hands and make it come alive. His work and his words conquered many hearts throughout his life, 
as they did at the first edition of the Delhi Photo Festival in 2011, where he displayed a working draft of his last photo series called The Longing, a work in progress that he seemed to have finished not long before his demise in 2012, and a glimpse of which we were able to see last night at the inauguration of this edition of the Delhi Photo Festival. The festival this year pays a tribute to this unrelentingly shy and charismatic artist. Now, one thing that was sure to quite about anyone who would come in touch with Prabuddho or his work was his grace. He seemed to be a certain embodiment of this word and it seems obvious even when one looks at you know, the video of his talk which was done in this very room in 2011 which is again uh, anchored by Mahesh parallel to his personal photographs many of which were female nudes. The very first photograph that he sold as a work of art was bought by his longtime friend, the sculptor K. S. Radhakrishnan. As the sculptor recounts in an article, in 1984, I remember when he showed me a few early prints from his experiments with photography for some feedback. This was one photograph of a female torso lying horizontally and the lighting was such that it reminded me of one of Henry Moore's reclining sculptures. The nudity of the figure was not important, but you can see the extreme sensuality. Radha or K.S. Radhakrishnan bought the photograph from Prabodho for 500 rupees and Prabodho spent more than half the money in framing it. But now I don't know if, I guess Radha is probably not here, but I guess, you know, we would all have liked to see that photograph, which was, you know, Prabodho's very first work of art. But um, it's with the launch of this photo book, Women, in 1995, that we were able to see this part of his work, and a much larger audience got to appreciate this extreme sensuality that Radha talked about. Now the female body, is a theme that was a favorite of both Moore and Pradosh, pra Prabhudo's father. And the two sculptors shared many stylistic attributes in their individual approaches, including the reclining nude as a privileged study of form. These sculptures demonstrate the reduction of form to 